Good day, folks. Welcome to the causes of World War II. How did it come to this? With the uh, roaring 20s and then falling into the 30s and the Great Depression, and then the Great Depression with the, the global effect uh, um, coming out of the United States and resonating around the planet, um, Germany falling apart, Italy falling apart, their economies totally crashed, rise of fascism, Japan's economy totally crashing, rise of fascism, um, China immersed in a terrible uh, civil war, uh, the Soviet Union under the leadership of Joseph Stalin uh, undergoing things like the Great Purge and uh, killing off of his own people, um, even uh, fascist uh, countries coming about in Latin America, uh, Juan Eva Perón in uh, Argentina. Um, so we have um, you know, some of these uh, dictatorial regimes um, really coming into power in the midst of this Great Depression, which is just one of the root causes of the Second World War. So overall, we can re really break it down to uh, six major causes here. Uh, number one, the Treaty of Versailles and how it completely mistreated Germany, uh, blaming Germany for uh, the brunt of the Great War <clears throat> and forcing them uh, to pay three, uh, $33 billion in reparations, which they never paid. It was not possible. Uh, the League of Nations. League of Nations extremely weak. Number one reason, because the U.S. isn't in it, even though the U.S. president created it, Woodrow Wilson. Um, the League of Nations, uh, the U.S. will never join it, and it has no real teeth. It has no military force. It's dominated by the likes of Britain and France. And it, it just rings of still social Darwinism and imperialism. And in Germany, uh, the Weimar government that comes into power. Remember, Germany was forced to change its government. Uh, it had to convert over to a, quote, democracy, unquote, um, and basically they set up a government in Weimar, a uh, town in Germany, and basically the Weimar government is decadent, uh, corrupt, um, and not really able to address the major issues facing the German people, like, you know, a, a billion dollars or a billion Deutschmarks for a newspaper or a loaf of bread, you know. Um, money is worth more to be burned for warmth in Germany by the 1920s and early 30s. The French. French have a very false sense of security. Um, they never really totally settled the score with Germany or Germany with them. Um, there's always been this, um, not always, but there had been throughout the late 19th century into the 20th century, this uh, back and forth between Germany and France, this animosity building. The French build themselves a huge line of defenses <clears throat> in the ground called the Maginot Line. Uh, problem is, by the 1930s and 40s, um, countries have airplanes that can just fly over stuff like that. And as we saw previously, the Great Depression. How could the Great Depression not be a root cause of World War II? And finally, U.S. isolationism, which we'll delve into more here. But the U.S. Uh, not wanting to be involved in global politics after suffering, you know, 114, 115,000 killed in World War I. Um, the United States government said, hey, look, we're not getting involved in European affairs any longer. Okay, but obviously you can see here, so just going through each of these, uh, the Treaty of Versailles, obviously you can see what it does uh, to Europe, dividing up territory. Uh, if you look to the um, to the west there, you can see France and Germany, that border <clears throat> where the French have occupied German territory. Uh, like I said, there's already tons of animosity between these two. If you look up into uh, northeastern Germany, you'll see that Germany is actually divided. Uh, and it was divided in order to give a Polish corridor to the sea uh, with the creation of Poland. And then some of these other countries that, you know, are no longer there. I mean, you can't go buy, buy your plane tickets today to Czechoslovakia. It uh, doesn't exist anymore, right? Uh, but these guys at, you know, the Versailles um, Conference, when they built this treaty, they drew all these new borders. And you look down there at the Middle East. I mean, those places are under, quote, mandates, unquote, of the League of Nations run by Britain and France. Oh, and those places have oil, too. And you can see the League of Nations membership. So, I mean, you know, the League has a lot of members. Now, of course, a lot of members are just going to leave uh, when they become aggressive like Japan or Italy. Uh, and the League of Nations says, stop, you can't do that. Those countries say, yes, we can. And by the way, we're leaving the League. Um, 
So really, even though you have some of these members in the league, the league has no real power. They did, however, build themselves a really nice, expensive headquarters, as you can see here. Um, it's a really nice museum or something today, probably, but um, the issue is they have no control over major conflicts. If a conflict breaks out, what is the league going to do? I mean, they can tell, you know, they can issue sanctions. Hey, don't trade with this guy. But sanctions are only as, as powerful as the countries that are enforcing them. They're not helping countries or forcing countries to disarm. Germany is rearming in the late 20s, early 30s, and the league is doing nothing about it because they have no effective military force. Now, they may not have known about a lot of the uh, armaments being built either, but nonetheless, uh, there's no military force to enforce anything anyway. And of course, the U.S., the strongest economy on the planet, um, <laughs> or at least it was uh, until we get into the 30s, um, is not a member. So our first real act of aggression by a fascist country that we see in the 1930s comes from the Japanese uh, and what comes to be called the Manchurian crisis where Japan uh, invades. You can see there at the top of the, um, of the slide there, Manchuko, uh, where the Japanese invade into Manchuria. The Japanese had already held on to Korea. They've had it since the 1890s, uh, since the Sino-Japanese War, uh, Chinese-Japanese War. Uh, they move into Manchuria, rename it Manchuko. Um, so that they can control the vast natural resources there. I mean, Japan is four barren rocky islands. They lack resources. Uh, so what do you do? You take over territory that has it. And operating under fascism, fascism says you're constantly expanding, right? You expand because you're also crazy nationalists, right? This nationalistic zeal. So you have to constantly expand. Well, in order to expand, you need fuel. So Manchuria was the place to go. And unfortunately, too, the United States didn't cut off trade with Japan, even though they went in and took off the, or uh, went in and took over this area uh, of Manchuria. And then you get um, Italy, Benito Mussolini, uh, Benito Mussolini, who comes to power in Italy in 1922, 1922 uh, with the black shirts. Um, Mussolini uh, in fascism, uh, he's uh, the first to create a fascist state. Fascism had actually been around, though, since the 1880s. Actually, a Frenchman named Georges Sorel uh, created the whole idea of fascism. But uh, Mussolini is the one who is the first to really put it into action to create an entire government. And in Italy, uh, Mussolini was said to make the trains run on time. Um, El Duce, the leader, as they called him, um, and he ruled with this this kind of iron fist. I mean, these black shirts were his kind of private, um, I guess, thug army uh, that went around the streets of places like Rome and Milan and wherever else. Um, Florence, who has really good ice cream, by the way. But uh, these types of places. And, um, you know, just, just bashes people. Uh, it says that order was kept uh, with the bludgeon and castor oil. Uh, these black shirts uh, were known to, uh, you know, capture so-called political opponents, um, torture them, tie them up, and, um, you know, bludgeon them, obviously, and pour castor oil down their throat. So that's how Mussolini's keeping order um, in Nazi, or Nazi, in uh, fascist Italy. All the women have been required to hand in their uh, gold rings, wedding rings, men too, uh, so that, that can be given to the state uh, to be replaced with an iron ring to show kind of solidarity and power. Um, women who have, I don't remember the number, 10 or 11 kids, <laughs> yeah, uh, you would actually receive a medal personally um, from Mussolini. I'm not sure how that would inspire you to have 10 or 11 children, but whatever. Um, because that's cannon fodder, right? As a fascist state, you need army. You need you need men to serve in your military. And fascism itself says that you as an individual are not important. It's all about the state. It's all about the unit. Well, as part of this um, nationalism, Mussolini promised that he would return Italy to the times of ancient Rome and make the Mediterranean a Roman lake. Um, well, part of this becomes um, this nationalistic zeal is to invade Ethiopia, and the Italians do just that uh, in October of 1935. And the Italians come in, they use poison gas, mustard gas, they kill thousands. And the leader of Ethiopia, uh, Hale Selese, uh, who very interesting guy himself, um, goes to the League of Nations. 
and he you know stands before the league he gives this great eloquent speech and basically says what are you going to do Wait, how can you help us help us please this is why you exist to which the league says uh, yeah the league can't do anything oh yeah that's right they uh, issued sanctions against italy And then, of course, you have Germany, where you have this Weimar Republic and the rise of Nazism. Uh, this lunatic uh, Hitler uh, uh, fought in World War I. Um, he was Austrian, um, but joined the German army during World War I, uh, was wounded a couple of times, uh, blinded. Uh, after one of the times he was wounded, doctors told him he wasn't going to survive. Figures, um, nonetheless, um, when the war is over, you know, he's going to use all that vitriol and anger and hatred from the Treaty of Versailles, um, along with the desperate conditions, as you can see there in the, uh, the uh, cartoon on the left, the desperate conditions of the German people uh, to get more support for the Nazi party. Uh, by 1928, the Nazi party is a political party. Uh, they're operating in the Reichstag, the German parliament, and they're gaining seats. They're gaining um, representation in the German parliament. Um, and in the same time, uh, Hitler in the brown shirts, uh, he has his own little paramilitary force under Ernst Röhm. Um, they're also going around, you know, bashing people. And the real heart of Nazism is actually in the south of Germany, uh, the Bavarian region. Um, but nonetheless, you know, Hitler is uh, this lunatic who's able to gain more and more favor. Uh, by 1928 into 1930, the Nazi party, they don't become a majority in the German Reichstag, but they do gain enough seats that they can manipulate um, legislation. So basically the president of Germany, a guy named Paul von Hindenburg, who was a World War I hero for Germany fighting in um, fighting against Russia on the Eastern Front. Um, you know, he's like this 80 some year old dude at this point. And basically, you know, with things in going the way they are in Germany, crappy, um, he needs a parliament that can pass legislation. So he goes to one of his um, colleagues, Franz von Papen, one of his advisors, and good old Franz von Papen says, well, we need to work with these, uh, this Nazi party, this National Socialist German Workers Party. So, um, well, their leader seems to be this Hitler character, so why don't we make him chancellor, and that'll get the Nazis to vote with us on legislation. Yeah, great idea. Um, Hitler himself, Hitler had actually uh, been sentenced to prison back in 1923 for trying to lead an uprising in uh, Bavaria. Um, and while in prison, um, he actually uh, pens his book, actually uh, dictates it um, to uh, Rudolf Hess, who types it, uh, Mein Kampf for My Struggle. And in this book, Hitler lays out uh, just the, the madness that he was um, talking about Lebensraum, uh, living space, uh, that the German people need more space to spread out um, their perfect race. He argued that the Germans were um, were uh, inheritors of this this uh, Aryanism, this perfect human race from way back, you know, it's lunacy. Um, but nonetheless, that you know this perfect race now needed more space. So uh, he talked about basically. You know, going into the Soviet Union, taking over Russia to have more living space for the German people. Yeah, Joseph Stalin's going to read Mein Kampf, as are millions of other people, becomes a bestseller. Um, don't bother trying to read it. It's um, it's just meandering and, and boring and, and goofy. But nonetheless, Hitler only spends you know a few months, like six to nine months in prison. Um, and uh, basically, you know, this book becomes a bestseller and Hitler just gains all this momentum. And Nazism itself is, you know, this, um, it's a cult. It becomes very cultish. Um, they create um, things like the Hitler Youth, Hitler Junge. Um, basically, uh, these young uh, boys, uh, teenagers, uh, who are recruited into this um, radical organization uh, where they receive military training. Um, and they learn how to live, um, you know, off the land and camping, things like this. And they learn camaraderie, working with each other <clears throat> and uh, wearing their later hosen and, um, you know, learning how to fire guns and you know, weapons, things like this. Because basically, you know, these kids are being trained for war, essentially. That's what the fascist state needs is more and more soldiers. Uh, there's also the Hitler uh, machins, the, the German maidens, the girls, uh, teenage girls as well recruited. Um, into this system 
and they're taught to be, you know, uh, homemakers, uh, how to sew and, and cook and provide for their man, but also provide for children. Uh, some of these girls, you know, as young as 15, 14, 15, 16, getting married off to uh, older German men. Uh, because, you know, these people who are being recruited into these organizations are considered to be Aryans. So the Nazis want reproduction of more people. Um, you have Nazism takes off so much, you have little girls coming to school with swastikas painted on their fingernails. Um, the anti-Semitism is just going you know, crazy there. You, you have stories being told to kindergartners about the poison mushroom. And the poison mushroom is actually supposed to be a Jew. And uh, the Nazis and Hitler blaming the Jews for all of their ills. Uh, all of the stuff, you know, just being bought, uh, you know, being um, taken in by the German people. Now, of course, not all the German people, but, uh, you know, a good enough majority uh, that keeps, you know, the rest of the people uh, quiet who may not agree. Um, in Nazi propaganda was some of the most effective propaganda around. Uh, you see using the Hitler, uh, or rather the ancient Roman salute there, uh, which kind of dictates uh, regimentation. Um, these, these, you know, this marching and order. Um, so, so all of these things, um, you know, the use of symbols like the, the swastika, which is a clip that you'll be able to see. Um, you know, all of these things is, is these kind of brainwashing agents. And Hitler had the same kind of policy Mussolini had. Hitler and Mussolini are actually very close allies. They, they even have postage stamps together. Um, and they would go into military parades together. But um, Hitler had the same policy. If you have so many children, Hitler would come out and give you a medal. I mean, women were just enamored with this guy uh, who had terrible flatulence and was a vegetarian and supposedly liked dogs, even though it looks like he actually abused his dog, which is really, really sad and angering. Um, but nonetheless, um, the Nazis are just fiercely popular in Germany. And here you see more. Uh, there you see some of the Hitler youth on the right and um, these young uh, girls on the left. Well, another root cause, of course, is the French. Uh, the French built this Maginot line, this huge line of defenses. They spent billions of dollars on it. Um, and when the Nazis invade in um, May, June of 1940, they just pretty much go around it. Um, and over it and basically turn back around and use it for a storage depot. But nonetheless, you know, the French were kind of lulled into this false sense of security that's simply not going to work. And then, of course, the Depression. Unemployment in the United States, you know, 25 percent. Unemployment in Germany, 35, 40 percent. Just imagine. Um, things are so terrible that they're actually having to print you know, Deutschmarks of 50 million in value uh, because the money just becomes worthless. You see the little kids there on the right using the money uh, like like uh, Lincoln logs, you know, just, just playing with it. Um, you would burn it for heat. Um, you know, with inflation, the German mark was worth less than one third of one cent uh, in the United States. So, you know, think about that. You know, when, when the currency crashes in Germany, it's more than just that, right? People have savings. People have retirement savings. If you're in your 50s or 60s, you've been saving for retirement for all this time, and then all of a sudden the currency crashes and you got nothing. And then back in the United States, the U.S., extremely isolationist. Um, number one, you see the guy, uh, Gerald Nye there, who was a senator, and there was actually a special committee put together um, by the, uh, the U.S. Senate uh, to try to figure out, you know, what really caused World War I. Why was this great war so terrible? And the Nye Committee report came to the conclusion that essentially it was arms manufacturers, the munitions industry, um, that really caused this, this conflict. Basically, they wanted to help cause a war so that they could make more weapons to make more money, right? Um, and this just, this Nye Committee report really leads Americans to kind of say, you know what, to heck with this. Um, uh, we need to make sure that we are not militarizing. We need to get rid of weapons. There are huge movements around, uh, you know, between Europe and the United States to, to, um, disarm, to, to lower the amounts of, you know, uh, battleships they have. Um, there's even, um, some treaties to say, you know, they, everybody agrees to never go to war again, things like this. And then, on, you know, which is really, you know, pushing them toward this isolationist approach. Um, 
guys like Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh is a rock star. I mean, this is a guy who flew solo across the Atlantic in 1927. Well, he becomes, you know, he, he's the movie star of when he wasn't in movies, and maybe he was, but he's just, you know, this very famous guy in the United States, and he helps found this um, isolationist uh, committee, the America First Committee. Um, so, you know, with people with this report coming out from Nye uh, and then people like Lindbergh, uh, Henry Ford, uh, supporting the idea of U.S. isolationism, well, the population kind of falls in line behind that. And, yeah, I mean, you had some prominent leaders. Uh, there's also uh, Charles, uh, Father Charles Coughlin, um, who was a... Um, once a supporter of FDR, became a, a big uh, detractor of FDR and also an anti-Semite uh, in his radio broadcast. But nonetheless, uh, U.S. isolationism from this America First Committee, um, you know, they go around the country. They have numerous, you know, chapters and, and members who push for the U.S. to stay out of any type of conflict. Uh, but if you look down there beneath um, their little... Um, uh, icon there. Uh, you'll notice when they start, September of 1940, but notice when they are dissolved. Because not everyone in the U.S. is isolationists. Some people, um, you know, uh, writers, journalists, reporters, uh, people even like FDR, um, they're looking at the situation, you know, Europe falling to fascism, Asia falling to fascism, and they're saying, um, wait a second, uh, you know, the Atlantic ain't what it used to be. Because you notice here in the cartoon, the Atlantic is very, very narrow. In other words, the United States is no longer protected by these huge oceans, right? Um, you know, in the 19th century, it wasn't easy to just cross the Atlantic or the Pacific. Not that it is at this time, but it's a lot easier than it was. So what this uh, cartoon is trying to get at is that these conflicts, even though they're thousands of miles away in Europe, uh, they will come to U.S. shores, and the U.S. has to do something about it. Well, Uncle Sam does. But basically, Europe and Asia are falling apart, and you see some of the major um, uh, fascist dictators here, or communist, or whatever you want to call Stalin. Uh, but Joseph Stalin there on the left, uh, running the Soviet Union brutally, uh, killing millions of his own people <clears throat> uh, with vast industrialization projects as well. Um, he does help, I guess, quote, help industrialize the Soviet Union, but at a very, very huge uh, environmental and uh, human cost. Uh, Hitler with the Nazis. Uh, the next person you see there, Benito Mussolini. Uh, the one you see after that, Francisco Franco, uh, the second from the right, uh, who's going to lead a uh, fascist, uh, uh, who's going to win the Spanish Civil War <clears throat> by the uh, late 1930s and bring fascism to Spain. Um, and actually somewhat helped Germany during World War II. They won't formally join Germany during World War II, much to Hitler's chagrin. Uh, and then Hideki Tojo, uh, the prime minister of Japan, also um, one of these imperialists, aggressors, fascists, um, who are uh, bent on Japan expanding and taking over and plundering. You have to remember, the Japanese view themselves as superior, just like the Europeans or Americans, their governments viewed themselves as the superior race. The Japanese feel the same way. So what is this fascism? Well, it's totalitarian. You see the word total in there. One person, total control. And you glorify the state. And we see that in all the propaganda with the Nazis and the Italians. Um, um, and even to an effect, you know, the Soviet Union too, right? Even though they're operating under this guise of uh, communism, let's be realistic, it's pretty much a fascist state, right? Um, the state controls all aspects of life. I mean, your life is controlled by the state. And you have one single leader uh, who smashes any type of um, uh, challenge to his power um, and becomes this, this figurehead of this fascist state. He's, he's like a superhero. You know, he's, he's romanticized, as we'll see here in some of the propaganda. Um, and this whole idea is, you too, you reject the Enlightenment ideas. There's no room for uh, rationalization, intelligence, theorizing, that kind of stuff. Um, instead, 
it's have a vision and do whatever is necessary to obtain that vision, right? Uh, there, there's, there is, you know, some creativity, right? Uh, but it's all about the will of the nation itself. Uh, there's no time for theories and debates and philosophy and things like this uh, in the fascist state. And basically, of course, you use propaganda to ignite this feverish nationalistic zeal and spirit. And you see that in these these depictions. I mean, down there in the bottom right, all Joe Stalin, such a friendly character. Um, but you can see in these propaganda images, you know, how uh, these leaders want to be depicted and sold to their people. Well, things really are falling apart, you know, in the 1930s. We talked about Japan and Italy. Uh, by 1930, Italy in 35, but now by 1936, we get the Rome-Berlin axis. There you see Mussolini and Hitler, uh, who formed the Pact of Steel. Um, and you can see, you know, Mussolini. Hitler actually had huge respect and appreciation for Mussolini. He kind of revered Mussolini because Mussolini had come to power 10 years before Hitler did. Um, but nonetheless, these guys, you know, forming this pact of steel uh, in the start of the Axis powers that will um, fight in World War II. And then terrible things go down in Spain with the Spanish Civil War. Uh, essentially, this guy, Francisco Franco, uh, creates his own military, <clears throat> as fascists tend to do, and basically goes to war against the Spanish government. Um, and in this conflict, uh, the Nazis come in and they try to help Franco win. Uh, and the Nazis have some new weaponry that they want to try out, including a pretty advanced air force, what they call the Luftwaffe, uh, air fleet. And basically, they use this uh, air fleet to help uh, Francisco Franco win his um, win the Spanish Civil War. And one of the worst examples of uh, the conflict, but also something that is foreshadowing of what World War II will be, uh, is when the Nazi Luftwaffe flies over Guernica. Um, which is actually a Basque town of the Basque people, but in Spain, um, and bombs the place on market day. So these people are out, you know, trading goods, animals, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables, and the Luftwaffe fly flies over and just bombs it. I mean, it'd be the equivalent of, you know, bombing a massive flea market on its busiest day, right? Um, but nonetheless, all these people just killed, and it's foreshadowing of World War II because World War II is going to be... Um, the first major war where civilian casualties um, are the highest, where civilian populations are purposely targeted um, and more civilians um, killed um, than in any other war previously. So Guernica really foreshadows this. And it also encourages the very famous painting from Pablo Picasso called Guernica. And if you look at this painting that comes out in the 30s uh, after the bombing, uh, you can just see, you know, the the chaos, the massacre, um, the various body parts of various animals all over the place that really captures the essence of this. And then the Japanese, the Japanese continue to be aggressive. Uh, they invade further into China by the late 1930s and commit to one of the worst atrocities in human history that comes to be known as the Rape of Nanking. Um, some 100,000 to 200,000 uh, Chinese men, women, and children in the city of Nanking um, are tortured, killed in the most heinous ways um, by the Japanese. Um, people uh, buried alive. Uh, people kept alive and tied to posts for bayonet practice. Uh, a couple of Japanese soldiers actually had a contest to see how many heads that they could collect in a single day. Uh, you see that image down there. Um, smashing babies on the ground, just terrible things, setting people on fire, hanging people by their tongues. Um, the rumor was every female between the age of 7 and 70 was raped by Japanese soldiers. Just an awful, awful atrocity uh, that happens during this time. Um, that's often also kind of uh, called the Forgotten Holocaust as well. Um, but nonetheless, um, remember the Japanese viewed themselves as superior, uh, and Japanese soldiers said things to the effect of they saw killing, you know, these Chinese civilians as no different than killing uh, cats and dogs or, or insects or whatever. That's how the Japanese viewed it. 
Remarkably, um, John McGee uh, was uh, an American um, Protestant minister uh, who stayed in Nanking uh, to try to film what was going on so that the world would see this and never forget what had happened. And he also, um, at the risk of his own life, sheltered uh, as many people as he could uh, to save them from the atrocities that the Japanese were committing. Uh, and it's, you know, it's his films, his, his diary entries. Um, where you know where we get a lot of information about what the Japanese did in China, and to this day the Chinese and Japanese they do not get along. Um, well, I shouldn't say they don't get along, but they're not exactly on you know friendly relations, uh, namely because of number one, the rape in Nanking, and number two, the Japanese invasion of China prior to and during World War II. And then the Nazis also become aggressive. Uh, Hitler. Uh, makes his first majorly uh, aggressive move in terms of territory in March of 36. Uh, Nazi soldiers march into the Rhineland, as you see there uh, on the map on the left, um, over there on the western side. And the Rhineland was occupied by the French under the Treaty of Versailles. But when the Nazi troops marched in, the French troops marched out. And Hitler basically is able to retake the Rhineland without firing a shot. A couple years later, um, Anschluss, um, which means uh, annexation uh, or adding on to, uh, where Austria uh, joins with Germany. Nazis march into Austria, and Austria basically just becomes part of Germany. This was also forbidden by the Treaty of Versailles. Um, so Hitler constantly you know, violating these treaties, uh, but the Allies not really doing anything uh, to tell him to stop. And then there's the issue of the Sudetenland. With the Sudetenland, um, you can see there in the uh, the gold color, these were territories um, taken from Germany to create the country of Czechoslovakia. Well, Hitler publicly uh, states that you know these areas are uh, predominantly German people, and that the Sudetenland should belong uh, to Germany. <laughs> so essentially, what happens is once he makes this demand, um, Britain and France. Um, finally respond. And the Prime Minister of uh, Britain, <clears throat> a guy named Neville Chamberlain, um, basically tells Hitler, okay, look, we, we need to talk this out. You know, we need to have a meeting. Uh, to which Hitler says, yeah, okay, let's have a meeting. And basically Hitler <laughs> has um, Chamberlain and the French uh, president, or maybe his minister, I don't remember, uh, come to Munich, Germany, right? <laughs> So you're already giving in by going to Munich instead of telling Hitler to come, you know, to London and knock this stuff off, right? Um, so they go to Munich, and you know this is all over the press, and you'll see that in these newsreels. Uh, if you uh, please check those out. And Neville, Ch I mean, people are you know on the newspapers watching film reels because they are just worried to death that you know World War II is about to happen, uh, that you know the world is going to fall apart yet again. And that the last hope is for Chamberlain to negotiate with Adolf Hitler and avoid war. So what Chamberlain does is he goes to Munich in what is called the Munich Conference. And it is considered to be the ultimate uh, form of appeasement. In other words, giving in to an aggressor's demands to try to keep peace. But we know how it goes with bullies, right? Uh, when bullies demand your lunch money and you give them your lunch money to not get beat up every single day, they're going to demand your lunch money. Uh, and that's basically what Chamberlain does. He goes to Munich. He gets Hitler to sign that paper that Chamberlain's holding up. Chamberlain flies back to London. He lands. Anxious press awaits, and Chamberlain happily holds up that piece of paper with Hitler's signature on it. Uh, and if you click on the YouTube link there on the left, uh, you'll actually hear Chamberlain's part of Chamberlain's speech to the press uh, saying, peace in our times. We've avoided war, basically. And essentially what they did at Munich Britain and France give the Sudetenland to Nazi Germany. They give it to Hitler, um, even though, of course, it was not theirs to give. It belonged to Czechoslovakia. Uh, but Hitler said, hey, you give me this, I don't want any more. Until, of course, he does. Um, within months, Hitler invades the rest of Czechoslovakia and forcefully takes it over. And now Czechoslovakia is also part of um, Nazi Germany. And now, what are the British and the French to do? Well, after this, they come to an agreement. They say, okay, if any more territory is taken like this by the Nazis, we will declare war on Germany. And really, frankly, there's just one more place to take that was 
partially taken away from Germany, and that's Poland. And in the midst of all this, <clears throat> in August of 39, uh, something odd goes down. Uh, Hitler actually sends his uh, emissary, um, von Ribbentrop, um, over to uh, Moscow uh, to meet with uh, Stalin and his foreign minister, Molotov. Uh, Hitler and Stalin, of course, never met. That would not have gone over well. They despised each other. But <clears throat> and, um, nonetheless, basically what this was, was a, a non-aggression pact. Essentially, the Soviets and the Nazis agreeing to not go to war against each other. Um, that's what was announced to the world. Um, on the more secret side, the, the side that they kept close to the vest of themselves um, was that they would divide Poland uh, between each other. So basically, uh, Hitler was telling Stalin that he's going to invade Poland, and he didn't want Stalin to think that he's going to invade the Soviet Union. Now, of course, Stalin's no fool. I mean, he's a evil, tyrannical, murderous dictator, uh, but he's not stupid. Well, it's crazy. Um, and he doesn't trust Hitler for anything, right? In Stalin's mind, this is just buying time. Stalin read Mein Kampf. Stalin knows that at some point Hitler's going to invade the Soviet Union. But to the rest of the world, uh, things don't exactly look great um, upon uh, hearing about this non-aggression pact and all the things that have gone down in the 1930s.